Uh, Speaker Johnson, great to see you here. Thanks for being here. Welcome back to the Capitol. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you are Speaker of the House. It kind of feels like you actually might have a different title, Herder of the Cats. <laughs> uh, that yeah. seems like what it's all about. Uh, what's the grand plan here to kind of bring this conference together? The grand plan is the same today as it's been since I took over October 25th. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note this is not a job I ever aspired to. Uh, we got ourselves in a bit of a pickle here. Uh, and uh, somebody told me, a mentor told me when I was young, he said, always remember, Mike, you know, real leadership is recognized and not imposed. And so it was never my objective to, to try to go for the gavel or be the speaker, um, but that's how this developed. And so we're very clear-eyed about this and also sober-minded because we have serious challenges. I mean, you can make an argument right now, if you look at all the challenges facing the country, it's the greatest collection of challenges probably in the modern era, maybe since World War II, maybe the Civil War, when you look at everything together. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, we have the smallest majority in the history of the United States Congress. Uh, I have a one vote margin right now, which, which means I can only lose one Republican if we want to advance any of our core principles or uh, our preferences in legislation, usually. And so in the midst of all that uh, challenge and all that chaos, we've got to be steady hands at the wheel. We have to demonstrate to the American people that we're driven by our core principles and eternal truth, of course, and that that's what's going to keep our country on the, on the tracks and that allow us to turn this around. And I'm, I'm, I genuinely believe if we do that, we'll be in a much better situation in January because we'll have a great election cycle and we'll be able to return the levers of power to people who care about those founding principles. Kind of playing for the long term, if yeah. you will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what has been maybe a proudest achievement of yours? What's been a regret or something you wish you could have maybe done differently? Well, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I haven't had time to reflect on that a yeah. lot because every day right now in this uh, tumultuous period, being the first speaker in the history of the Congress that's ever taken over midstream in the middle of a Congress, there's no playbook for this. And so uh, what we do every day, prayerfully, humbly, is try to uh, try to govern well. And, and that is to be, be guided by those principles. And that, I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm proud of that, but I, I do think it's something that uh, has been a, a real challenge to, to, to hang on and do that to keep everybody moving in the same direction. Um, you know, people sometimes say when I'm out, I've, I've been in 23 states so far, traveling around the country over the last several weeks, uh, trying to help all of our incumbents and our candidates so we can grow this House majority and be in better shape. Everywhere I am around the country, people say, it seems like the Democrats stick together more than Republicans. Why is that, right? <clears throat> and I, my simple explanation, and it's not in jest, is that Democrats typically tend to think more kind of like a union, you know, they sort of stick together. Mm -hmm. They're more monolithic, they move as a herd. They're more kind of social animals, right? Republicans, by contrast, are rugged individualists. You know, we, we care deeply about our core principles and our philosophy and uh, we're not easily moved. And that's a great blessing, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you're trying to keep all those cats together and move in the same direction with a one vote majority, it sometimes presents challenges, so but speak, we're doing that. Speaking about challenges, the House Freedom Caucus, I mean, look, you're one of them. I mean, you, you know the deal. Uh, they're, not, they're not happy with um, some of the stuff that you've done, whether it be, you know, you said no more CRs, and there were more CRs, and then there was the not, you didn't read the bill, you know, didn't get 72 hours, and not even a chance for amendments on that spending bill that recently, the omnibus that passed. Right. Why can they trust you uh, at this point? They're, they're clearly concerned about the way you're governing. Yeah, so what, what some of my colleagues will privately admit, but not always publicly, is they understand we have the biggest challenge that's ever been presented to the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago, Newt Gingrich said on, on television that the speaker's job is now impossible. Mm -hmm. And we talked later, I said, Newt, it's not impossible, it's just extremely challenging. Because in, in the age where uh, social media exists, you know, that didn't, that didn't exist when Newt had an 18 vote margin and was moving the contract with America. And we talked about how that would have presented extraordinary challenges if every member of the Republican caucus in that era could go online every day and tell everybody what they don't like about every single bill. It presents a really unique and different challenge. But as I told Newt and I tell all of our friends, this is the modern era, this is the modern Congress, and we have to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan is the one that taught us the principle that I'd rather get 70 or 80% of what I want mm -hmm. than go over the cliff with the flag waving, right? Mm -hmm. the, the process of the legislative uh, body is that you have to build consensus and sometimes you can't get 100 percent of what you want mm -hmm. especially when you have the smallest margin in u.s history so mm -hmm. it's a consensus building exercise and we're not going to be able to throw as we like to say hail mary passes on every play mm -hmm. it's more right now three yards in a cloud of dust it's you, you move the ball up the field every day as much as you can mm -hmm. and you get the next first down and you stay in the game and then ultimately you win it that way and that, that's the era that we're in
Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, you're going to speak to her this week. Have you spoken to her? I've, I tried. I tried over the two-week break. She wasn't interested in um, speaking. Mm. Uh, and that's okay. Look, Marjorie is upset about the spending bill, and guess what? So am I. I it's not the bill that I would have drafted or all of us would have drafted mm -hmm. if we had the majority in the House and the Senate and had a Republican president that would sign it into law. But instead, we have Democrats in those other two chambers, mm -hmm. the Senate and, of course, the Oval mm -hmm. Office. And so if they know over here that we have a one-vote margin, so I have virtually zero leverage to be able to negotiate and get a better uh, package. So the alternative was sure. binary. We either do that we shut the government down. And our, our evaluation was exactly what the polls are from. If we shut the government down, it would be very painful for the American people. They would blame the Republicans, and we would lose the House majority. So that, that was not a real choice that we had. Yeah, what about, uh, as it relates to Marjorie Taylor Greene, real quick, so, so you've reached out, but she's not returning your calls or something along those lines? We, we exchanged text messages over the break uh, multiple times and, and told her that I really would love to visit by phone or at her convenience, and she said well, she wasn't interested in that. So, mm, okay. You know. Let me ask you a little bit about what's going on with that situation. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been personal with this to you. I mean, she says you're, you know, um, basically a deep state operative. She didn't use the word operative, but you're working for the deep state, in essence, paraphrasing. Uh, also, she's attacked your faith. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that kind of personal reaction to the fact that she's said some of this stuff. Well, I try to follow all the biblical admonitions as I do every day, and one of them says she bless those who persecute you. I'm getting a lot of practice in that right mm -hmm. now. Um, and that a soft word turns away wrath. And that, um, you know, those who are opposing you, you don't hate them and return, you know, evil for evil, you return good for evil. And so that, that's the way I live my life. That's the way I operate. And so I don't harbor any ill will towards Marjorie, never have. I like Marjorie. Mm -hmm. I understand why she's upset. She's frustrated that we can't score touchdowns on every single play. Mm -hmm. But the reality of the situation here is that we have to do this incrementally. We've got to demonstrate to the American mm -hmm. people that we can keep the train on the tracks. And so pulling a motion to vacate, removing the speaker right now, is exactly the opposite of what we need to show the country. We can't close the Congress down because that's what will happen. Sure. They will blame us, right? And so it won't hurt our chances of growing the majority or our party or President Trump's chances for his election because all of our fates in, in some sense are tied together. So it's, um, it's, it's really a, a very dangerous thing to be waving around a motion to vacate right now. Uh, when we've got to demonstrate that we can keep this country moving forward. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope that you realize that in the end, uh, uh, and I think others are trying to make that case. Tonight. Yeah, do you, do you believe that if there's some sort of motion to vacate that she goes forward with this, that there will be some Republicans, one or two, whatever it is, that jump and go with Democrats, and Hakeem Jeffries is all of a sudden speaker? How, do you think that is a potential reality here? Well, listen, if the chair is vacated, it's certainly possible you get a Democrat speaker because we've already demonstrated, I mean, I think 13 total members ran for speaker before I was elected. Um, and uh, there's, it'd be very difficult for anyone to get the votes at this stage, which means that that position would be open for a dangerous, probably potentially long amount of time, mm -hmm. which means the Congress is shut down. Now consider what's going on around the world right now. You know, China, Xi, is wanting to move on Taiwan. You've got Iran threatening to openly attack uh, in a big way. Uh, Israel, you know, R Russia is marching through Ukraine. I mean, if the, if the U.S. House of Representatives shuts down, that is a very dangerous prospect, not to mention the economy and everything else. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do here. If you put this Ukraine bill, even with some of your creative suggestions, on the floor, that's going to probably trigger that motion to vacate. I mean, in other words, there's people in the House Freedom Caucus saying, why even put it on the floor? I mean, the last time, uh, it was a majority of the majority. I mean, Republicans basically voted against Ukraine funding in terms of the majority. So why put this on the floor? Why even go there? Well, we're, we're working through all those issues with all of our members. We're trying to build that consensus that we talked about. Um, it, it is a lot more palatable to most members if you're talking about military aid, lethal aid, not, not the humanitarian piece where, I mean, no, no American taxpayer should be uh, tasked with, you know, propping up the pension system of the nation of Ukraine, of mm -hmm. course. But um, there are many people here who are concerned about the prospect of Vladimir Putin marching through Ukraine because many believe and the classified briefings we attend, you know, have a lot more detail on this, that he has other plans, that he might pursue that further. He might be emboldened to move on the Balkans or attack a NATO country, and then, then we, we're in a situation where we may well have boots on the ground. So uh, supplying the weapon systems that are needed to hold him back actually puts President Trump in a good position so that when he comes in in January, he's strong enough, he'll have strong leadership on the world stage again, and 
I'm confident he could broker the peace there if it's if the conflict is still ongoing. So, but you have to we have to do the right things to position ourselves to not abandon our allies and not uh, allow tyrants to parade through Europe. I mean, that's really what's at stake. So, but there's a consensus that has to be built. We've got to get a majority of the members here to agree upon that, and we've been working very carefully, and methodically through that to, to figure out how to how to uh, how to handle it. Do you believe a Ukraine bill will come up in the next week or two? Well, stay tuned. We're we're working on that right now. Everybody was home for a district work period for the Easter break, and uh, we've just come together tonight as a fly-in, and so uh, we'll all be gathering and. There'll be lots of thoughtful discussion about that, how to handle it, because it's a very important challenge for the Congress and for the American people. Let me ask you on the Biden impeachment inquiry. Uh, are the votes there? Uh, I'm assuming most people think they're just not there, and this might be turning into some sort of criminal referral. Well, we, <clears throat> we, uh, we, we've been doing that investigation very methodically sure. through three committees, as you know. We've done it in the very opposite way that the Democrats did. When they impeached President Trump twice, they, they did all of those attempts. It was openly partisan and political. I mean, they, they planned it before he even took office. And so we made the case very, uh, very consistently, and I did myself, because I was on President Trump's impeachment defense team twice, uh, that this was a, a charade, that it was a mockery of the process, that they had politicized impeachment, which I often argue is probably the heaviest power the House of Representatives holds in the Constitution next to the de declaration of war. Um, but what we've done is the opposite. It's a slow, methodical process through three committees of jurisdiction, uh, trying to determine the real facts here and connect those dots. And what we found is alarming. And, and I think most of the American people uh, recognize that something is amiss here and that mm -hmm. Hunter Biden's business dealings were well known by his father yeah. and he was involved in the conversations and all these things. Mm -hmm. Tens of millions of dollars have been paid to the family. We still don't have the ultimate answers on that. And our committees are working methodically to try to connect those dots, mm -hmm. and then we'll make the ultimate determination on that. But they're doing their constitutional duty sure. here, and that's really important to remind everyone. We had no choice in this if we're going to follow the Constitution. Yeah, but is it un it's unclear at this point whether or not the votes might be there? Uh, well, we're, we're going to draw all the evidence together, make the case to our members and to the whole membership of the House, which, again, is the responsibility of, of the House of Representatives under the Constitution, mm -hmm. and then we'll let the, the, the body uh, draw that conclusion. I mean, I, I'm convinced, as most Americans are, that this is a terribly corrupt uh, family and that they were engaging in enriching themselves at the expense of the American people. Yeah. That's a real problem to most, most folks. Abortion, obviously, this has been uh, really tough and from a messaging standpoint by Republicans. I mean, it really does appear that they've, they blew it out of the gate after Roe v. Wade. What's going on exactly in terms of your suggestion to Republicans on how they maneuver through this issue? But specifically, let me start with President Trump obviously coming out just recently and not necessarily saying he's not going to there's going to be no federal abortion ban, but he is saying let's leave it to the states, which that is what the pro-life community have been saying when Roe was in place. So it seems to be a consistent pro-life position. But how do you see what President Trump specifically said? Yeah, I, I, I come from that movement. I was one of the right. litigators who litigated pro-life cases um, for about 20 years before I came to Congress. And it is was part of our argument. We always argued that Roe was an egregiously unconstitutional decision because they invented the federal right to abortion out of thin air. Obviously, it's not mentioned in the Constitution. It's not in its context and, or its text. Um, and, and so Roe really did rip that right away from the states, the people in the states who were legislating in that arena prior to January of 73. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we finally did have it overturned, and, and that was part of our argument. I think that's what President Trump was, was articulating in his video that he, that he released here short, um, a while ago, um, and, and it got a lot of attention. Look, I'm pro-life, you're pro-life. We, we, this is our belief. Our party has always been pro-life. Um, I'm the product of an unplanned teen pregnancy. In fact, I was born January 1972, almost exactly a year before Roe. And I'm so grateful, always have been, that my, my parents were raised Catholic and, and um, they, they knew that that was wrong and they allowed me to be born. What we have to do right now, our challenge, mm -hmm. is to build a culture of life so that more people, more families, more uh, mothers, even in unplanned pregnancy situations, mm -hmm. are able to make that choice. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Breitbart famously observed that politics is downstream from culture. And, and before you can have a political consensus on an issue that's this controversial, you have to build a cultural consensus first. And so we're in the process of doing that. We've got a lot of work to do. In some states, it's been very successful. And in other states, we have a lot more work to do. And, and I think that's ultimately what uh, the president's talking about. I will say this, though. Mm -hmm. November, we have a big choice. Mm -hmm. You have a choice in voting for president and for members of Congress. Mm -hmm. On, in a presidential race, you have Donald Trump, who has been the most uh, successful pro-life president 
of our lifetime. Right. Since Roe, I mean, he, he, he did appoint the justices to overturn Roe v. Wade. His bona fides are proven. He's, he's pro-life. And then you have President Biden, who is arguably the most pro-abortion, most abortion-supporting president, mm -hmm. certainly of the modern era. Uh, maybe of all time, and that's a stark contrast. So, so it, you're saying it's a smart move, at least in these times right now, politically, it just seems to kind of fit the moment for now? Well, I'm saying that we, we recognize right now that the, the votes don't exist in Congress to, mm. to have a federal ban of, at any level, right. um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We, we have to make our case. I mean, the pro-life movement, we need to explain to people why the sanctity of human life is a, an American value. I mean, yeah. it, it harkens back to the Declaration of Independence, our nation's birth certificate, right? Mm -hmm. These are self-evident truths that we're created by God and that he's the one that gives us our inalienable rights. Yeah. And if we forget that, uh, we're, we're gonna be imperiled as a nation. And I think more people are forgetting that. And so our job is to remind them of those founding principles. I know you tried to move a standalone Israel bill back uh, a few months ago. Where is that today? Can you move a standalone Israel bill? We were speaking to Jim Jordan uh, just this past week, and he would like to see that, obviously. I, you obviously know that. What's your take on that, but more broadly about Israel and the, the biblical relationship between Israel and America? We know about the Abrahamic covenant, covenant between God and Abraham, about it. basically, if you, I will bless you. Uh, and and uh, as it relates to what America will be blessed if indeed they stand by Israel, but if they don't, what are the repercussions if they don't spiritually here in America? Yeah, this is a, a core tenet of our belief. I'll bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. We want to be on the right side of that. So not only does it make sense to support Israel for all the geopolitical reasons and the fact that they're the only stable democracy in the Middle East, which is a tinderbox, and that they've been a faithful friend to us, um, it's also an article of faith for many of us and many members of the, of the Congress. And so um, this has been a top priority for me my entire life, and it continues to be. Uh, we did try to pass Israel as a standalone funding measure. Uh, that was in the first week of my having the speakership, way back in the fall. Yeah. We passed Israel at the spending levels that were requested. We just added a pay for. We were going to take the funding out of the IRS uh, expansion slush fund and spend it on Israel as, uh, instead. And uh, that made Chuck Schumer ignore the bill. He did not want to do that. So we came back again and we brought it to the floor pay, without a pay for, uh, fully, you know, Israel with a little bit additional funding on that uh, to make up for the time that had been lost. And uh, 166 Democrats in the House voted against it. The president of the United States, Joe Biden, threatened to veto that mm -hmm. bill. It was shocking to me. So we've tried twice. Um, we're going to get that done. The time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, we're determining the best path forward. And, and I think more and more Democrats are turning their backs on Israel, which mm -hmm. is alarming. Yeah. Because uh, to your point, our Judeo-Christian heritage mm -hmm. ties us together uh, as a nation. The histories of both nations are entwined in that way. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we ought to uh, deeply respect. I think Israel must remain a close friend and an ally of the United States for mm -hmm. all the reasons we've discussed. Uh, I do want to get to a couple last faith questions, but before I do, let me circle back real quick to Ukraine because there are some folks on that Ukraine bill that would like to see some stuff, uh, tough border protection yeah. uh, in that bill. Do you expect that to be as a part of that bill? Because that's going to be a deal breaker, obviously, for Democrats but w and for some Republicans, quite frankly. I'm talking about this, this, the, the, the hardcore, if you will, sure. immigration stuff that the House Freedom Caucus wants. Is, could that be in the Ukraine bill? Well, I want it as well. I've been saying it since the day I got the gavel and before. Yeah. Uh, that national security begins at our own border, obviously, yeah. and we've got to get control of our border. We've got to secure it yeah. before we even consider, you know, assisting other nations. I've made the case over and over daily yeah. uh, to the president. I've, I've told him individually. I've told him publicly, privately. Uh, we, we've demanded it in every press conference we've had. The border is a catastrophe, and it was done by design. The president intentionally opened it up. It's the reason we've impeached Mayorkas, and that'll be delivered to the Senate uh, right. this week. Um, we had to take extreme measures because what they've done to the country is unforgivable. You know, yeah, I think the real estimate is we probably have about 16 million people who have come across that border mm -hmm. just since Joe Biden took office mm -hmm. a little over three years ago. And, you know, we have uh, fentanyl as a leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 49 because of the open border. We have human trafficking and all the societal ills that come from it. Now you have violent criminals. We have 340 suspects on the known terrorist watch list that have been apprehended. We don't know how many are actually here what terrorist cells are set up around the country. And now we're seeing violent acts and even murder committed on innocent American citizens by violent criminals who come across the border. Do, we have to stop it. Do you think, though, that, that immigration, some immigration um, 
you know, measures will be in that Ukraine bill? Look, I've been insistent to the White House that they should use their executive authority that they have right now. The, the president has- What about the bill itself, though? The Ukraine well, bill? These, are all inter these issues are all intertwined. intertwined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been uh, we, we've been consistent about that since day one. And yeah. I've said the same thing over and over and over. And mm -hmm. the White House is very stubborn on that. I think they want that open border, and I think their actions show that. Why? Why do you think they want it specifically? It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but I think it's actually true that the ultimate design is to turn some of these illegals into voters for their cause mm -hmm. and to change the census outcome in 2030. Mm -hmm. Because if you can distribute people around the country in strategic uh, ways and put them in strategic places, the census does not just count citizens, it counts residents, mm -hmm. all persons. And that could dramatically affect the map in Congress. I mean, it sounds like some sort of crazy, you know, criminal design, and in my view it is, but I think that's what they're doing. Because they have to replace some of the folks that are moving out of the inner city or the city structures into the suburbs, is that what yes, you're saying? Yes, and the, and the idea is, as the president is demonstrating even this week, mm -hmm. uh, you just give things out to people and you win constituencies. The student loan thing, for example, of course the Supreme Court has already said, Congress is the only one that can make a change on that. It can't be unilaterally by the president of the United States. You know what? He's lawless, he doesn't care, he's doing it anyway, because yeah. he's trying to win over constituencies. Your faith, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, obviously this just in, really important to you, and you wear it on your sleeve, not showy obviously, but you're you know, you're, you're not bashful for sure. Um, what have those conversations been like with God, if you will, uh, as, you be, uh, as you've been Speaker of the House? Um, you know, what, what is he trying to kind of maybe tell you? What are some senses that uh, you have uh, between you and the Lord here? Yeah, it's a personal question, and, and I'll answer it. I mean, I, you humble yourself before the Lord every day. He sh Micah 6, 8, he's shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, right? Mm -hmm. That's all of our admonition every single day. And when, you, when you're given a, a, a position of authority, you have an even greater responsibility. And I've, I often have read so many times and, and, and meditated over uh, Solomon's prayer after he was uh, you know, given the throne. And, mm -hmm. And uh, God appeared to him in a dream, and he said, ask me for anything you want. And he asked for wisdom. And it says there that he, he, I need the wisdom to govern your people, because how can they be governed? And that is my, my sole desire. I just, we, we want the wisdom and the sermon and the stamina to do the thing that, that we believe God's called all of us here to do. And that's my consistent and steady prayer. And I'll tell you, it's so encouraging to us as I travel around the country and meet with faithful people all over this nation, from out west to Long Island to the Deep South, Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many faithful people out there, many, many viewers, 700 Club, I know, right. who, uh, who feel that we're all in this together and they're supporting us prayerfully and, uh, and consistently. And when they come up and tell me that with tears in their eyes and they grab both shoulders and mm -hmm. say, our whole family, our whole church is praying for you, I feel that, we know it, and that's what sustains us to do this job. By the way, if uh you didn't know any better. Uh, if you watch MSNBC, did you know you're a Christian nationalist? Oh yeah, I've been called all sorts of things. Oh, I don't I even know what that means, by the way. Right, uh, well, I was gonna ask yeah. you about that. Well, uh, try to maybe put that into context because in essence, the left is trying to demonize oh, sure. tens of millions of Bible-believing oh, Christians. Sure. If you believe this Judeo-Christian country and you happen to go to church, oh, and if you happen to uh, like Donald Trump or vote for him, uh, that is uh, not a good trinity according to the left. Well, we, we've been mocked and, and uh, I mean, mercilessly in the press. They, they've tried to attack me and my family, my wife and children. And look, we're undaunted by it. I mean, you know, you're, you're, that is going to happen if you stand for truth. And we're not new to this. Um, but um, but it, it's, um, you know, it, it's something that you got to face, especially when you step into this arena. What we're trying to do in Washington is articulate the same values and actually use much of the same exact language that previous generations of legislators here used, mm -hmm. certainly that the framers used. I mean, Washington, our first uh, president, the father of our country, said of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, in other words, how do you save the republic? Right. He said religion and morality are indispensable supports. Mm -hmm. And then John Adams comes next, the second president. He said, our constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. Mm -hmm. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I use that kind of language, but when you use it now in 2024, people are aghast. They can't believe what a radical, what a crazy. What they were saying is this is the foundational principles of our nation, right. and we have to defend those things, because if you're going to have a government of, by, and for the people, you have to have a moral consensus, or the, or the system will not survive. And nowadays, if you say the word spiritual warfare, the left needs smelling salts at that point. I mean, so, so talk, to me, talk to me a little bit about the spiritual state of this country, of America today, and do you see it in those terms, spiritual warfare going on? 
I do. I mean, if you're a, a, a Christian, that's how you understand these things. We're, we're really in a battle of worldviews right now. It's not even a battle between Republicans and Democrats anymore. It's a, two competing visions over what kind of nation we are, who we are as a people. We believe in the what I call the seven core principles of American conservatism, but it's really the seven core principles of the country itself. It's individual freedom, limited government, the rule of law, peace through strength, fiscal responsibility, free markets, and human dignity. Mm -hmm. Now, each of those things are grounded in eternal biblical truth, to be honest. We revere those things. Those are the same great things that have got in our nation since its founding, but right now we're in a battle with a rising number of people who have open disdain for those principles. They want to uproot them and replace them with something else. They, they envision for America instead, they want us to be some sort of European-style socialist utopia. But we understand that to be a dangerous fool's errand. And as our Amman colleagues and our Amman student groups who come and visit the house all the time, remember, Marxism, communism, socialism, are grounded in the belief that there is no creator. There is no God. And that's the essence, that's the, the foundation of their belief. That is not who we are. You know, if you walk out there right now on that house floor, inscribed above the, you know, on the marble above the speaker's rostrum, that big um, stand up there, it says, in God we trust. It's our nation's motto, right? Mm -hmm. It was placed there in the early 60s. And if you read the guidebook that everybody gets, the, the tour guidebook to come to the house, mm -hmm. it says in the guidebook, it reminds them, that was placed as a rebuke to the Soviet era, it was the Cold War era, right? To the Soviet's philosophy that is a godless philosophy. Mm -hmm. We wanted to de demonstrate who we are as a nation and how we're different. What happens to America if that godless philosophy wins out? Ronald Reagan said, if we ever forget that we're one nation under God, we will be a nation gone under. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that speaks volumes about who we are. We, you know, there's a reason that we're the most exceptional, the strongest, most successful, most powerful, most benevolent mm -hmm. nation in the history of the world. It's because we were founded on those Judeo-Christian beliefs. Mm -hmm. And if we abandon them, we abandon them at our peril. And that's the real risk right now, the real struggle that we're in, mm -hmm. is are we gonna stay tied to those moorings that made us who we are, or are we gonna jettison that in exchange for something else? And my job every day is to not only guide the legislative agenda, but to try to remind us that that is who we are. You know, scripture also reminds us that without vision, the people perish, and we have to cast that vision. In this election cycle, we can't just go out and say what we're against, a lot of things we're against. We're against all this, this yeah. chaos that's erupted. We have to say what we're for and who we are. Yeah. And I think that resonates in the hearts of the people. And my last question, you were Speaker of the House. Would you see it as for such a time as this? Do you see it from a spiritual perspective? Uh, look, I do. God chooses unworthy vessels. In fact, yeah. Scripture is very clear. Um, he chooses sometimes um, the simple things to confound the wise. Um, I'm, I'm under no illusion about, you know, I have no value other than as a servant. I'm trying to be a servant leader here. And mm -hmm. at a very challenging time, in very difficult circumstances. Yes. I sat down with our good friend Leonard Leo a couple weeks after I got the gavel and he said, you know, you're, you're probably the first movement conservative to ever hold the gavel. And I said, that's, that's right. And he said, but we also have a very perilous political situation and uh, we'll all be praying for you and we wanna support you to navigate through that and, mm -hmm. and help us get our country through this. And that's my humble prayer every day, you know, that we would be able to serve well and, and bring honor to God in the process. Speaker Johnson, thank you. Thank you.